Good morning, everyone. My name is Tammy Pham, and I am a pre-dental programming coordinator for this year's 12th annual pre-medical and pre-health professions conference. I would like to first extend thanks to Double AMC for their support and help in making this conference possible. I am very honored today to have the opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Robert Gillis. Dr. Gillis earned his DMD degree from the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. In the following years, he completed a rotating internship in the U.S. Public Health Service and three-year residency in prosthodontics and maxillofacial prosthetics. He then received an MSD from the University of Minnesota. Dr. Gillis has served many notable positions in the academic arena, including clinical associate professor at UC Davis School of Medicine and faculty member at UC San Francisco. He has been an active member, past president, and board member of several organizations, including seven years on the board of the California Dental Association. These are just a few highlights from Dr. Gillis' illustrious career in the dental field. Now please give a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Gillis. Thank you very much. So um, the question is, why do you want to be a dentist? That's, that's the question. And it's a question that um, I think it's useful to look at from the standpoint of why do people choose the path of dentistry? Um, for me, my mother was born on a small farm in Pennsylvania. and. Um, it's almost dead center in Pennsylvania. My grandfather was a farmer, and in the winter he mined coal. Um, my mom often told me that they didn't know there was a depression because from their standpoint, they had enough to eat, and uh, they had enough to keep the house warm, and that's really all that much mattered. My dad was from New Hampshire. Um, this is um, a structure that no longer exists it's called the Old Man of the Mountain. It was a naturally occurring structure in uh, the mountains in New Hampshire. Um, my father um, put himself through school. He met my mother when he was an orderly at St. Vincent's Hospital in New York City. She was a dietitian. In those days, uh, if you were a woman and you had any inkling of wanting to go into mathematics or science, you were heartily discouraged. And so the only area that she could go in that was somewhat science related was dietetics. So they met. My father subsequently uh, went in the military. Um, after that, he went to dental school. He had a DDS, PhD in microbiology. He was chairman of uh, both the microbiology department in, in the medical school and the endodontic department at dental school. So the bar was pretty high in my family. Uh, my mom, my mom uh, retained her passion for math and science and was math science coordinator for an entire school system for the last 20 years of her life. So, but uh, when I was in college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I can tell if somebody came up and asked me, are you going to be like a dentist like your dad? I'd say, absolutely no way. No way. I just, I couldn't see the, anything exciting about dentistry whatsoever. Um, about halfway through my sophomore year, I started to look at, you know, I had to figure out what I was going to do with my life. Uh, it was the 60s, so uh, if I didn't decide to do something, I knew where I was going to end up someplace in Southeast Asia. That, that didn't sound particularly exciting. Although I love my country, uh, going to Southeast Asia wasn't particularly exciting. And dentistry at the time um, was pretty much looked on as just something that people uh, pretty much filled teeth and pulled them. That was it, which is uh, the purpose of this slide, is to, because that was the state of the art. What happened to me was I sat down and looked at what my gifts and skills and talents were. I like science. I like people. I had a pretty strong artistic inkling. And at the time, I actually was thinking about majoring in psychology. What's interesting is that I have utilized all of those in my career in dentistry. So I guess my first message to you is, Take a really solid assessment of what your gifts and talents are. 
as you decide what you want to do, especially in dentistry. And what part of dentistry do you want to get involved in? So I'd like to give you two other career paths that two very good friends of mine uh, chose. Uh, the first one was Wallace. Wallace Bellamy was uh, born in New York City. He's African-American. He, about the time he was 13, his dentist took him aside and said, Wallace, I think that dentistry might be a good career path for you. So Wallace wasn't quite sure of that. Nobody in his family had ever gone to college, let alone gone to, gone to graduate school. But Wallace persisted, and he went to college. He was the first member of his family to graduate from college. And he went to dental school, and he will, in about two years, be our, the president of our district dental society. Our district dental society encompasses Davis, by the way. We have a very large dental society. Uh, we go up to Yuba City, over to Davis, and south uh, down past Elk Grove. So we have a very large dental society, about 1,600 members. The other person is uh, Dr. Deborah Finney. Um, Dr. Finney was born in Alaska, and she was um, born into a family that was uh, very much fishing oriented. And at first she went to college and got her master's degree in biology. Then that, she wasn't quite sure that's what she wanted to do. So she subsequently uh, went on and uh, became a dental assistant. After that, she became a dental hygienist. After that, she went to dental school. And after that, she got her training in periodontology. She is our first, she was our first female president of California Dental Association about three years ago. She practices out in Folsom. Marvelous, wonderful person. So I would ask you, using those as examples, to look at what your career path might be. How do you want to choose to continue on? And is dentistry a, right, a good fit for you? Some people um, comment about, you know, how can you, uh, how can you work in people's mouths? The mouth is uh, actually, the bacteriologically, is the dirtiest place in the body. It's uh, dirtier than the other end demonstrated here. Uh, there are 750 different kinds of potential bacteria in your mouth, 250 in most people, and there are an enormous potential source of pathogens in the oral cavity. Uh, when people ask me how can I work in the mouth, I say, well, it's more aesthetic than the other end. And that's, that's not a slam on proctologists, I just can't see myself looking at that end of the body all day long. So what kinds of careers exist in dentistry? Well, obviously dentist, hygienist, dental assistant, laboratory technician, practice management. All of these areas are changing very rapidly. The area of the hygienist and dental assistants is rapidly expanding. We have expanded functions here in California for both of these areas. And I think the model of dental practice will change drastically probably within the next 10 years. I think the solo practitioner, practitioner dentist, um, I don't think will be a thing of the past, but I think there will be fewer solo dental practitioners and much more group types of practices and practices probably more closely connected with medicine. So the specialties in dentistry, I think to look at uh, dentistry from the standpoint of what's going on and um, what are some of the advanced areas that are taking place, I thought I would kind of run through uh, what are the specialties of dentistry. I think public health is one that often gets, um, doesn't get enough uh, praise. Uh, dentists are better than physicians in attempting to do prevention. A lot of what we do is really aimed at prevention. Um, I think one of the best examples of prevention is fluoride. Fluoride is sometimes politically controversial. Uh, it's politically controversial over here uh, in Davis. Uh, and yet, from a scientific standpoint, it shouldn't be controversial at all. 
Fluoride has been studied since the 40s. Uh, fluoride is found naturally in the water supply in Colorado. Uh, the original uh, identification of it is called Colorado brown stain because dentists in Colorado were finding that at that time, when they used belt driven hand pieces, that they were breaking their burrs trying to drill through people's teeth because their teeth were so hard, and it's because they had fluoride in them. Um, my dad was involved in Gary, Indiana, in the U.S. Public Health Service and did one of the original studies on fluoride uh, for the Public Health Service. Uh, scientifically, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of articles on the use of fluoride and its safety, and yet politically, we are still arguing about it. The fact is, if you fluoridate the water, you present an enormous amount of caries in children and even in adults. Um, there are many other areas of public health dentistry trying to get different aspects of the population to understand um, the oral cavity and how to make the oral cavity healthy. Um, for instance, baby bottle syndrome is rampant among certain socioeconomic populations, and it's a cause of uh, great problems and great distress. Um, so looking at, at some of these areas individually, I'd like to just talk for a few minutes about um, what's going on and some of the advances and where things might be going as we move into the future. In periodontics, a Center for Disease Control has noted that over 50% of the population in the United States has periodontal disease, 50%. That's, that's pretty enormous. If we had any other disease process that inhabited 50% of our population, we would be doing something much more aggressive about it. Periodontal disease is an infectious disease, just like caries. They are infectious diseases. They're caused by bacteria. We do not have a vaccine. I'm not sure we'll have a vaccine in your lifetime. You cannot cure it with mouthwash. That is bogus. I just saw an ad yesterday for Crest Pro Health mouthwash. Kills 98% of the bacteria. But see, that's not the question. For how long? That's the question. So how long does it kill 98% of the bacteria? 30 seconds? You know, because the fact is that the bacteria in the mouth are meant to be there. We don't even understand all the relationships between all the bacteria in the oral cavity. So the question is, if we have this disease that infects this large percent of the population, what should we be doing about it? Um, the other thing, and I think more and more the connections with medicine are becoming evident. For reasons that make no sense to me, we somewhat separated ourselves from medicine probably about 100 years ago. And we have operated sometimes as separatists. And yet, as far as systemic diseases, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, perhaps some aspects of kidney disease, are all related strongly to periodontal disease. So if we want to cure our population, improve their health, then we should be much more aggressive about dealing with the disease process in our patients. I think one of the more exciting areas is the fact that the oral cavity is really a gateway. One of the things that is exciting is from a research standpoint is spit. Spit's exciting. There are more different kinds of things in saliva. Enzymes that help us to digest our food, uh, antibodies that help to protect us from various kinds of, of uh, disease process and bacteria, and yet we understand very little about this. There are a number of studies going on to use saliva as a marker for many different disease processes in the human body. And I do not think it's an overstretch to say that probably within the next 10 years, we will be using some of these markers and that those of you that go into dentistry will be administering some of those in your offices, which I think is, is very, very exciting. 
carries is also rampant, especially in lower socioeconomic classes. Caries is a disease of civilization. It is a disease largely related to processed and refined sugar. If we look at our diets, we have a huge amount of processed and refined sugar. Now, the link also between saliva and caries is that despite having the same kind of a diet, some people, because of their saliva, have immunologic properties that prevent them from getting caries. So although it's genetic, it's genetic via their saliva. So this is another exciting area as far as where we might be going uh, in the future. Pediatric dentistry is going to be much more closely linked to medicine, especially since the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there is much more coverage available for children, and children really need to have much more uh, active and aggressive care. Children miss days of school. Children are ill with fevers. And worst case scenario, children even die from dental disease. I think in a civilization like ours, that's a travesty. That is totally unexcusable. There is absolutely no reason why kids should die from caries. Now that's just, it's not really, really not, not acceptable. And we aren't doing enough to prevent that. More and more there is a link between pediatric dentists and pediatricians. I think for a time there was a belief that somehow dentists were different and the area of the body that we treated was different. When I was on the faculty at UC Davis, uh, I came over here and gave a lecture, a one-hour lecture, to the medical students on the oral cavity. One hour. Now, in one hour, what in the name of heaven can I say that would impact them? I would tell you that most physicians view the oral cavity as a dark abyss that exists between the lips and the pharynx, where there is nothing. And that somehow, it behaves differently than the rest of the body. It doesn't behave like, you know. Let me give you a couple examples. Uh, I see cancer patients. I go, I go on rounds, not as much anymore, but I did when I was at UC Davis. And I would have oncologists who would tell their patients not to brush their teeth. Now, that's, that's a, totally illogical. And they'd say, well, they're going to get a bacteremia if they brush their teeth. Well, yes, that's true. They will get a bacteria if they brush their teeth. But if they allow the patient to develop more severe gingivitis, the type of bacteremia they're, they're going to get is going to be more severe. So, and I would say to them, if you had an open wound on their arm, would you clean and dress the wound? Well, of course. I said, well, you have an open wound in their tissue, in their mouth. And it behaves exactly the same. So. All of the science and biology and biochemistry and everything else that you take in dental school has value. It has value because it helps you understand how the human body reacts and that really the oral cavity, dentists, really we should be much more closely related to our physician brothers and sisters and we should be talking a lot more and that all of our patients would do much better. Orthodontics is changing. Um, most people, if you say orthodontics, they think braces. And while that's true, there are lots of other ways that uh, teeth are moved. And our orthodontists really are growth and development specialists. And the importance of growth of the jaws and the airway is being looked at. And these are the folks that really have the knowledge base to take us further into how we can help children as they develop to prevent some of the problems that are related to their airway problems. This is a graphic that shows um, some of the imaging that's possible. 
Yeah, we have lots of 3D imaging. We can literally reconstruct a jaw with printing and CAD CAM. Um, we can view and literally turn these images around and rotate them all different ways. This is fairly recent, but incredibly exciting. The part of dentistry that I inhabit, prosthodontics, um, part of what I do is take care of cancer patients. Sometimes uh, treatment of the cancer is surgical and it revolves, involves removal of a portion of the palate, which means that uh, you have a big hole between your mouth and your nose, which makes it hard to talk. And we make prosthetic devices for that. Another exciting area, uh, this is a, a Swedish physician, P.I. Branamark. He's an orthopedic surgeon, and he was doing orthopedic research on tissue development and growth, and found out that uh, the implants that he was using totally integrated into the bone and could not be removed. And as with most science, serendipitously, he talked to a dental colleague and they said, wow, we, we could use something like that in the mouth. And he developed dental implants, which have since, by the way, been utilized in orthopedic surgery. And much of orthopedic surgery now utilizes the Branamark type of osseointegration. So hips, knees, different kinds of artificial joints that used to be cemented in with acrylic resin are now placed using osseointegration. Just an example, this is a patient who uh, lost his ear from cancer. He has some implants. We utilize the implants to retain an auricular prosthesis. If you have an oral tumor, oftentimes it's found in the floor of the mouth. To remove the tumor, it requires removing a section of the jaw. This is a, a cone beam study, which is a, a type of tomogram showing uh, where we've, they've taken a, a piece of the bone in the leg, the fibula, and done what's called a fibular free graft, moving the bone up into the oral cavity, anastomosing the blood vessels, and uh, allowing the new bone to grow. And then we can place some implants <coughs> and place a prosthetic device. One of the things that I'm most proud of in dentistry is our community reach outs, both our local dental society and California Dental Association have enormous community reach outs. Our local dental society last year screened 30,000 children in the school system and did over a million dollars worth of donated dentistry. CDA CARES is, uh, exists in all over the state. Uh, we'll be back here in Sacramento in March. Um, have literally provided millions and millions of dollars of care that to uh, needy patients. This is a, a line out of Cal Expo, and this is one of the patients uh, who was very pleased to have the care and service. Many of these people have no care whatsoever. Many of them are indigent or uh, socioeconomically maybe working but do not have the money to afford dentistry. And lack of dental and oral care can be bad enough that it will uh, cause people to not be able to go to work. Uh, plus, I mean, simplistically, if you went to get a job at McDonald's and you didn't have any front teeth, what do you think your chances of being hired would be? So with something very simple, with a temporary partial, we can help some of these people to become employed and become good citizens once again. So pretty simple and straightforward. I think uh, dentistry is exciting. I think it's more exciting than it's ever been. I think there is a new dawn coming in dentistry. I think that all of you will have a chance to advance dentistry, that how dentistry looks in the next 10, 20 years will be very different. When I entered dental school, we still had old chairs with belt-driven hand pieces, and we all stood up. Uh, and we did mostly fillings. We're doing many, many more things. Our interface, our research is advancing. And I welcome all of you, hopefully, into our dental profession. And I hope all of you will carry it forward and 
be as excited about it when you get to this, your point in your career where I am as I am today. So thank you very much for your attention.